Okay. Uh, all three are civil engineering uh, students. And I've had the pleasure of having them in class several times. They're, they're very good students. Uh, they were given a very challenging project. They were asked to uh, do a wetland design, and it required them to do some, some modeling work that went well beyond what they encountered in class. And I know uh, halfway through the semester they were very frustrated. They were getting uh, lots of errors, and, but, but they were persistent, uh, and I'm very pleased with what they produced. So uh, let me introduce uh, Eric Bradshaw, uh, Brandon Dirkholz, and Juan Cross. We'd like to thank everyone for coming to the Nuremberg Wetland Restoration presentation. Our site, which is shown here, outlined in yellow, lies adjacent to Nuremberg Road in southern Vandenberg County. It lies approximately two miles north of the Ohio River and one mile southeast of USI's main campus. And this picture here kind of shows you uh, in reference to Burdett Park and USI of where it's located. The property was originally donated to the university in 1967 by Mary Nuremberg with the one requirement that it be used for educational purposes by no later than 2013. Up until last year, the property was leased as farm ground, and the site has been altered in order to gain usable farm ground. It is intended that the property become an outdoor teaching laboratory for the biology, engineering, and geology departments. Since the property has been altered, it is no longer considered a wetland. Mm -hmm. However, we know it was historically a wetland based off of the National Wetland Inventory maps. You might be asking what constitutes a wetland, and basically it's an area that experiences groundwater at or near the surface for a period of at least two consecutive weeks throughout the growing season. Our basic objective was to evaluate the wetland restoration potential of the site, and if we find a high likelihood of success in restoring the wetland, a detailed design plan will be provided. On our site, there are uh, two streams. We have the, the main tributary, which bisects the site, directly into the main channel. Uh, as Eric previously stated, uh, the main channel has been altered from its original banks. Uh, we have here two photographs, one from 1966 and one present. Uh, you can see the comparison between the two. Uh, in the present photograph, uh, the stream has been straightened in two locations. This was most likely done uh, to increase the velocity of the water through these sections uh, to reduce the frequency of bank pool discharges. Uh, or to reduce the frequency that the field would flood. Also on our site, there are five culverts. Uh, through field observations, culverts three, four, and five have been neglected from our uh, hydraulic and hydrologic analysis uh, due to insufficient flows or just that the flow through the culvert uh, did not actually encroach on our wetland area. Before we could do our uh, hydraulic and hydrologic analysis, uh, we first needed to do delineate the watershed for our site. Uh, since we had two streams, we needed to delineate two watersheds. You can see uh, for the main tributary, uh, this watershed outlined in a smaller yellow box uh, and the main channel outlined in a larger green area. Uh, you can see in the top left corner of this area that a large portion of the university uh, is within this area. This will increase the impervious surfaces for the watershed uh, due to urbanization. Here are some properties of the watershed that Brandon was just discussing. Uh, you can see a difference in the sizes of the watershed that is running the main channel and the one running the main tributary. Uh, the larger watershed goes about 900 acres. Also, uh, the bigger watershed constitutes about 9% of impervious cover. That means that 9% uh, of the land is uh, covered by uh, materials such as asphalt or concrete, and this is due to urbanization. Uh, these two halide cells, group number and time of concentration, they were really meaningful for us in order to develop a hydrologic model. Group number is a uh, empirical um, hydrologic parameter to determine how much of the rainfall becomes abstraction and how much becomes runoff. And this was calculated using the NRCS group number method. Uh, time of concentration, it basically is how long the water takes from the no, uh, from the farthest point of the watershed to drain into a channel. And this was calculated using the Clark Unit Hydrograph Method equation. Uh, in order for us to uh, run a, a hydrologic model and an unsteady hydraulic model, we had to use a measure rainfall hydrograph. Uh, we used the one from October 5th and 6th of 2013. Uh, those two 
base, we experience about uh, six inches of rain. For our hydrologic model, we use uh, AGHMS. AGHMS uh, will basically simulate uh, watersheds, so you see this one and this one, as basins, and then transform the given hydrograph and transform it into runoff that will later drain into a channel. Um, for example, this main channel uh, basin describes a bigger watershed, a 900 acre watershed, and it's later, once the hydrograph is input into the software, it will transform it into a flow that will an unsteady flow that will drain to junction two, in this case represents the main channel. Uh, the software uses the NRCS group number method to describe uh, how much of the water is abstraction and how much is runoff. Here's where group number becomes very important. And here, this is an output graph from the unsteady result, and then the red represents abstraction, that is how much of the water is absorbed by the soil before it becomes runoff, which is here represented in blue. Um, then it will use a cloud unit hydrograph method to expand this runoff and expand it over time. And this was a really important step for us because this will become an unstream boundary condition for a hydraulic model, which is going to be TechRAS. As Warren mentioned, we used TechRAS to develop a hydraulic model of the site. Uh, the three main inputs for any TechRAS model are flow data, geometric data, and uh, the managed roughness coefficients. The flow data, as Warren mentioned, came from HMS. The geometric data was provided to us in the form of a topographic survey that we received in an AutoCAD file. Within AutoCAD, we created our alignments along the main channel and main tributary, <coughs> and then drew in cross sections perpendicular to those alignments to follow the topography of the site. Uh, the Manning's roughness coefficients were calculated using a publication titled A Guide to Selecting Manning's Roughness Coefficients, and they were found for the main channel and uh, the left and right overlaps. Here are a couple pictures taken from the site. The top one is a cross section in the northern reach of the main channel, and the bottom one is the culvert that lies within the main tributary, and they are shown with their corresponding geometric cross sections from Pickers. They look a little funny, and that's because Hecarass does not use a one-to-one -one scale, so they look really skinny and tall, when in reality they're actually modeling the actual conditions very closely. This picture here was taken immediately after the October 2013 rainfall event that Juan discussed. As you can see, above the culvert there are some logs and debris, and those are called rack lines, and they provide an indication of how high the water got during the event. The video that's playing on the left is the actual simulation run within Hecarass of this event. And you can see that the model predicted that the water would overtop the culvert, and judging by the rack lines in the photo, that's exactly what happened. So this provided us with confidence in the accuracy of our model. Once we were confident in the accuracy of our model, uh, we found there's little to no storage area on the site, uh, so we needed to create a proposed grading plan. Uh, so what we've done here is we've uh, taken water from the main tributary and diverted it using an inline structure here uh, into two proposed storage areas, a northern storage area and a southern storage area. Within this northern storage area, there are three sub-basins. Uh, each sub-basin, as you continue into Northern storage area increases in elevation uh, to encourage the water to flow further into this northern storage area. Uh, they're also at different elevations to uh, promote biodiversity within the site. Uh, you may be asking why are, why are these so irregularly shaped? Uh, we did this to uh, give the appearance of a less engineered look, uh, so it's more natural. Uh, for the as far as the southern storage area, uh, it has two primary. Uh, services which it does. Uh, it serves the purpose of as, uh, an overflow for the northern storage area and then it also acts for a catchment for on-site rainfall runoff. Uh, in order to create these storage areas uh, we need to excavate nearly 4,500 cubic yards of soil. Uh, a small portion of that will be used to create this uh, small parking lot area and with the remainder uh, there are two options that can be done. The first option would be to just place this uh, material on site. Uh, here's the proposed fill areas. Uh, or we could transport the material off site to a different location. Uh, we would also like to recommend that uh, when excavating these areas, that uh, the contractor excavate deeper than necessary and then replace that soil uh, with uh, the top soil to 
encourage a plant growth. Here's a chart showing the, the volume capacity for each storage area by elevation. Uh, you can see the northern storage area has a capacity of 1.27 acre feet uh, of water, while the southern storage area has 0.5 acre feet of storage capacity. In order to divert the water from the main tributary, we've uh, designed this inline structure system. Uh, it consists of two courses of roughly eight cubic foot uh, sandstone blocks. The first, first course will be placed so that the tops of the blocks will be at the base uh, elevation of the tributary. Uh, so the second course will be placed, uh, the tops of the block will be at about two feet above this uh, base elevation. This was done so that in large rainfall events, uh, the water will be able to overtop, the in inline structure will act as a weir, and the water will proceed down to the, the uh, main channel uh, as it actually does. Under this inline structure, we'll be placing a geosynthetic liner uh, with river rock on top of that for erosion control purposes. We have to modify our existing conditions in the Hercules model. Uh, we Model or uh, we started at tertiary one, tertiary two, following the grain plan that Brandon was just describing. Also, we started an inline structure on the main tributary to divert the water from the main tributary and encourage it to go to the storage areas. And also, we deleted core number two that was uh, located here in the main tributary. And this is because it was no longer needed on site. Here's an output graph from our unsteady results of the event on October 2013. This is a uh, the results for storage area one, this is stage, uh, this graph basically uh, describes the stage uh, elevation of water over time. And here you can say, you can see how we could have expected about a foot and a half of water on storage area one, and in storage area two, about one foot. Um, this pretty large, this, uh, the event on October uh, 2015 is a large event. Uh, we also ran the software with uh, lower uh, intense, intense rainfall events such as as low as one inch and we put about four inches of uh, storage into storage area one. There's a cost analysis chart for the option where we're gonna keep the fill on site and the project's gonna last a week, so 40 hours of work. This chart includes uh, machinery for the air board and that includes the barbitory roller, the doser, excavator, scraper. Also we're including a nuclear density gauge technician to check for compaction and to follow our solar specifications. And also includes operators, laborers, the construction of the, of the inline structure, and the consulting for the job. Um, excluding the consulting, the total amount will be $54,000. And this, but this amount would be significantly reduced if we are able to, to um, sell, uh, to give away the soil or even give it away, or even sell it. Throughout the course of our project, we installed a couple of instruments on site. The first one on the left is a rain gauge that we installed approximately one mile to the west of the site. And this gauge is capable of recording rainfall data accurate to one one hundredth of an inch. On the, on the right is our groundwater monitoring well that we placed in the lowest portion of our site. And its purpose is to measure how far below the surface groundwater is at any given time. And this will need to be monitored for one year, especially throughout the growing season, and uh, this data will be very useful for future research on the site. We received historical climate data from the National Climatic Data Center. We had data from 1950 to 1991, and this was used to calculate evapotranspiration, which I'll discuss on the next slide, along with monthly and yearly rainfall totals. This chart here shows monthly rainfall totals, with the blue line representing the average and the green and red lines representing the 30th and 70th percentiles, which by definition is the normal range of rainfall. Evapotranspiration includes evaporation and water that is consumed by plants, and it is one way in which water is lost from a wetland. So we calculated this using the hardgreaves simani equation. As you can see in the chart, the summer months have a much higher evapotranspiration value, while lower months have, winter months have lower values, which would be expected. And all of this data will be useful for a future water budget analysis at the site. So in conclusion, by removing culvert number two uh, from the main tributary and 
constructing the inline structure in this tributary to divert the water into the proposed storage areas. We feel that there's a high likelihood of recreating a wetland environment on our site. We'd also, uh, before we take questions, we'd like to acknowledge a few people. Uh, we'd like to thank Donna, Dr. Uh, Mitchell, and all the engineering staff for all that they've done for us over the years. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mendoli for providing us with this project. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hill, uh, our faculty advisor, for all the hard work and effort that he put into this project for us. We couldn't have done it without him. Uh, we'd also like to give a special thanks to uh, Professor Sprouse, uh, for all of the work that he's done for us over the years. I'd like to wish him a happy retirement. Uh, questions? Uh, we're gonna run a, a small video of uh, our simulation of the, uh, of the main channel tributary over banking during that October 2013 rainfall event. All right, does anyone have a question? What's your dirt that you're going to, your uh, fill dirt? Uh, what are you talking about, soil specification? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, classification, yeah. Uh, it's clay. Yes, clay still. Why are you using a vibratory compactor? Uh, there's, a, it's, there's a lot of sand in it. Is it? Okay. A lot of sand. All right, so. As, as you get lower in elevation, the sand content increases. So sand. most of it's going to be sand? Nice job, guys. Good project. Uh, about five slides back, you talked about an 18 inch rise. Uh, they're, they're right there. Come back one. Is that assimilated on your new model? Yeah, yeah. This the model for the study for the rainfall event from October 2013. So but, but on the new model, after you yeah, put all yeah, the storage that's, in. That's what it's so does that raise over the whole area or just no. in your storage? Yeah, this is I think we show the storage area number two, which is the one that is the storage going to, and that, that was about one point four. Okay, how close that is to overflowing those? Is it? Uh, is the, it? the first one? Uh, yeah. That's overflow. Yeah. overflow it would still overflow area. a little bit. It would overflow in the storage area too. But not go anywhere else. Okay, no. good. good. How many uh, cubic yards of excavation are you looking at to, to reshape your site? Okay, 4,500 cubic yards. Okay, and how, how did you uh, look at the equipment productivity for that? Did you just say it's going to take about a week, or did you actually look at individual productivity for yeah, different we, pieces of equipment? We mostly based it off the, the capacity of the scraper. Uh, I think it was a 16 cubic yard scraper. Uh, so the amount of time it's going to take to, to fill and go to the fill areas. Uh, okay. Based All right, thank you. Did you have an overflow for uh, storage area two? You said that once storage area one fills up, it would drain into two, but what if you had a large rainfall event and the uh, two overflow? Um, uh, so, the, I mean, we had a we had a six inch rainfall event, which it, it didn't overflow, but if it, if it were, uh, there's a small natural channel that would, uh, it would overflow into, into uh, another roadside ditch that would continue to flow directly into directly into the back into the main channel. So you can see uh, it would flow through this natural channel and then uh, there's a roadside dish that would, uh, connects back to the main channel. Any final question? 